Hey there. Subscribe to my channel and also press this bell icon. So you can get latest video notifications. And this is absolutely free. Listen to the telephone conversation about advertising a house for rent and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, Bellingham Real Estate Agents. Could you hold, please? Okay. <sighs> Sorry about that. What can I do for you? Yeah, I'm looking for some tenants for my house, and I was hoping you could advertise it for me. Sure, no problem. Is it here in Vancouver? No, it's just outside, in Richmond. Very nice. It's a house, you say? Yes, it's a family house. It's a two-story, quite modern. Right, and you're wanting to rent out the whole place, that right? No, no, just two rooms are for rent. That's two bedrooms, plus the use of the rest of the house. It would really suit a couple of students. Okay, can you just tell me the address, please? Yeah, sure, it's 3281, number one road, Richmond. Okay, that's quite a ways out. And how much were you thinking of for these rooms? I thought $700 per room would be a pretty fair price. Is that per month? Sure. Okay. You'd get at least 1000 if you were in Vancouver. Yeah, I know. Hmm. Any other costs? Uh, just the cleaner who comes in once a week. Cleaner. Okay. And how much would your tenant have to pay her? Uh, him, actually. It's a guy. Uh, and that would be another $30 a month. Okay. And it's nice? I mean, it's got a view and things? Sure, it looks out over the ocean. Uh, no garden, but there's lots to look at from the lounge. Okay. And your name is? Peter Trueboys. Trueboys. Is that B-O-Y-S? No, it's T-R-U-B-O-I-S-E. Trueboys. Nice name. And your address? It's the same one as I just gave you. Fine, as above. Got a phone number you can give me? Sure. I'm calling you from it. It's 6047416. And a cell? Yep. That's 903-277-3987. Before the conversation continues... You have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Good. Now let's get down to the serious stuff. What have you got in the kitchen? A fridge, of course. Yes, a fridge. And there's a dishwasher. Got facilities for washing clothes? Yeah, a washing machine in the basement. And a dryer, too. Okay. Gas or electric stove? Electric. And there's a microwave as well. Fine. Now, what about the house? Anything worth mentioning? Sure. There's a room for playing ping pong and pool. Great. And how's it heated? It's got central heating, but no fireplace. That's too bad. I like an open fire in winter. Air conditioned? No. Nope. No conditioning. I suppose you've got a TV? Sure. Cable? Uh, afraid not. I never got around to putting it in. Fine. What sort of tenant are you looking for? Students, you said? That's right. Although, it's quite away from the university, though. I guess they'd need a car. That's true. Still, there's a shopping mall just a block away. I'm looking at a map right now. Yep, just a small one. No movie theaters or anything like that. We're right by the beach, though, and that's something. Sure, especially in this weather. I wish I was there myself. <laughs> Any other entertainment in the area? 
There's a cocktail lounge on the corner and a couple of hamburger joints. You'd have to go downtown for a movie, though. Oh, and Boyd Park is only a couple of hundred yards away. Okay, Mr. True Boys. I'll post this up for you, and I hope you have some luck. Thanks. Bye. Bye, and take care. Sure. Thanks. That is the end of part one. Now it turns to part two. You'll hear an introduction about how to make a resume and apply for a job. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Welcome everyone to today's seminar on CV and interview skills. Remember, your CV is probably the most important document you will ever write. It opens the door to your career, and that job interview is probably the most important meeting you will ever attend. It's like stepping through that open door. So let's roll up our sleeves and get down to work, shall we? First of all, I cannot possibly tell you everything you need to know about writing a resume in the time we have. But let me tell you that there are dozens of great websites on the internet. These will give you all the suggestions you need. If you look at the paper I gave you, you will see a list of the dozen most popular sites. I can mention a couple of important points, however. One is that your CV or resume should not be too long. A page is about right. Why? HR departments do not have the time to read long documents. Too many people are sending too many CVs. After all, the economic crisis of 2008 is still very much alive. Everyone needs a job now. No matter how short you make that resume, though, you do not want to forget to tell HR how to contact your references. References are people who will give you a recommendation for a job. That's usually an ex-boss or a professor who knows you well. Do not use relatives. I don't care how much your mum loves you. Also, when you send that CV, be sure to include a typed cover letter. A cover letter is a letter where you basically are asking for a job. It's like introducing yourself. Make it brief. The real information about you is on that CV of yours. And please, make sure the letter is typed. It doesn't matter if your handwriting is beautiful or not. Companies only read typed letters. Another point about CVs is you should try to have an attractive layout. Maybe use different type fonts or colours to highlight the information. Some people include a photo. You can find dozens of examples on the internet. Whatever layout you decide to use, however, avoid all spelling and grammar errors. I used to be an HR manager. If I saw a mistake, that CV went into the garbage. Something you write in a CV is a description of your skills and experiences in an interesting way. Mention training, too. I mean, these are what get you hired. Do not just say, I have lots of experience, or I have many skills. Tell that boss what you did, for what company, and when. Better, tell him how well you did it. Don't just say, I sold houses. Say, I sold two million pounds worth of houses in my first year. That is, say something to make the person reading excited and curious. Finally, speaking of CVs, it's sad, but some people actually forget to provide a contact number. That's pretty silly. You wrote a great CV, you have HR dying to meet you and they don't know how. You forgot your phone number. 
oh sure, if you apply online, they have your email address, but you just showed them you're forgetful. Why are they going to want to talk to you after that? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. All right, moving on to the actual interview. I'll go over what you need to know by the end of it and what you can discuss and negotiate on later once it looks like you'll be offered the job. First, there's working hours. It's not that necessary to hammer out the hours off the bat, especially since it's easy to come off as lazy when the first thing you bring up is how much you're going to have to work. You can also find out more about possible promotions later on. It is important, however, to get a feel for how much you'll be paid. You should make sure the salary range is commensurate with what you're worth, and if you're not, you can move on to better opportunities. Being sure you're going to make what you want to live on is much more important than issues like your pension. You're all so young that your pension is not going to matter for quite a long time. You should find out about what skills you must know for the job and what they'll teach you. In addition, if the company will provide training, you should find out how long the training period is and whether it is paid. Beware of any jobs that want you to train for a long time without appropriate compensation. Speaking of compensation, find out about holidays as well. Do you get paid vacation time? Are you allowed to take personal days? Do you have to work on national holidays? Once you work out these main issues, you can move on later to details like the location and expected attire and whatnot. Wow, that's a lot of information. Let's take a break so you can think everything over and ask any questions you may have. Don't hesitate to come and see me if you need any clarification on all this stuff. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear two students called Jimmy and Kathy talking to their tutor about the current research paper. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Before we start, Jimmy and Cathy, thanks for coming in today to talk about your current research paper. Well, I will also give you some suggestions for your future presentation later. That's great. OK, I've read the introductory chapter and so far I like where you're going with your research, you two. Thanks. What did you think of the procedure section? I haven't got there yet. I'll get to that and the results and discussion section in a bit. Oh, if you haven't read the rest, are you just saying you like the introduction? No, the layout is really well done. You have each section clearly marked and have the header and footer perfectly formatted and your title page is right on the money. A lot of students have trouble with that one. To be honest, we did refer a lot to the example we received in class. That's good to do for spacing and layout, as long as you're not also copying the information. The background information is a little sparse, though. You may want to add to it. You think so? 
I was more worried about whether I had enough data. You definitely need more background information. I would think about finding some more online articles or doing more research in the campus library. That's a good idea. We can go tomorrow. I find it too tough finding the subject matter in the online journal database. I also like being able to flip through the physical journal as opposed to trying to scroll down on a computer. Me too. Oh, I almost forgot. I've included all of my citations in the abstract, but could you help me with the bibliography? I should be using a bibliography, right? Not an appendix. Sure. I can help with that. Yes, for this type of scientific research paper, list all sources that you cite in the body of your paper in a bibliography. Go to the website I gave you last time to see the exact way to list each source. Okay, thanks. I'll do that. We still have a lot of things to fix up. Yeah, but there's a lot of good stuff here to work with. So, enough about the paper. How is the presentation going? Well, it's all right. I'm going to go try out the new presentation software while Jimmy's working on the bibliography. Yeah, we are hoping to make an animation of an actual pump, but still have a lot to learn about how to do that. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. Who would have thought before we started this project that we would be able to recreate the motion of a pump? This stuff is just so interesting. So glad to hear it. Yeah, I am glad I took engineering this semester. I would definitely like to keep up with it. You know, there's an organisation called the Machine Engineer Society. You should look into joining it. You'd need to score well in your engineering class to qualify, but I think you can do it. Hmm, interesting. I will definitely check it out. I would really like to get in contact with some professionals in the engineering field to find out more. I don't really know anyone in the field now, though. I think if you keep meeting people in your classes and professors, you'll, you'll be able to get in contact with some really helpful people. Well said, Jimmy. If engineering pumps is something you both are specifically interested in, make sure you stay up to date on new developments. In fact, you could visit the local water treatment facility periodically to see what new developments are going on. Hmm, that may be a good way to get some practical experience. Well, I don't think they would let you handle any equipment by just visiting the facility. If you really want to get your hands dirty, so to speak, I would recommend instead seeking a summer internship. Wow, you have so many helpful suggestions for getting a leg up. Now, if only you could tell me how to get my work published. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Well, honestly, all you really need to do is, once you have a dissertation, present it. Present it often and to many audiences and once you get feedback, adjust it. You'll get published one day. Wow, this meeting has been truly inspiring. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. 
In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about the role of sleep in humans and animals. Of all the biological processes in the animal kingdom, sleep is perhaps the most important. A human can survive for almost two weeks without eating. But did you know that one week without sleep can be fatal? It's even worse for animals, especially for those who must avoid predators. Without sleep, an animal is much less capable of avoiding an attack. This is the case for all animals, whether they are reptiles, mammals or fish. Let us look now at how different animals sleep, reasons for their ways of rest and the potential problems they might encounter. In marine life, sleep must be balanced with breathing. For example, the dolphin must float to the surface as it sleeps in order to breathe. Like other large sea mammals, they keep one eye open and one half of the brain awake at all times to maintain some amount of consciousness required to breathe and to watch out for possible threats. They sleep with only one brain hemisphere in slow wave sleep. Birds also have unusual sleeping patterns, mostly due to being constantly on edge in the presence of numerous predators. They usually sleep quite lightly. For example, Swainson's thrush, also called olive-backed thrush, is a medium-sized thrush that takes hundreds of naps during the day, each of which lasts just a few seconds. While migrating, migratory birds tend to function well on micro-naps. Horses, on the other hand, do most of their sleeping standing up. Scientists think that horses developed their habit of sleeping upright as a defense mechanism, a way of protecting themselves against predators and a standing position keeps a horse in a constant state of readiness to race away if danger should approach. Also, horses do occasionally take short naps lying down. Horses are heavy animals with big muscles, but their bones are surprisingly delicate, so lying in one position for a long time could well injure a horse. Just like humans, animals can also have sleeping problems. Dr. John Hendricks and Adrian Morrison from the School of Veterinary Medicine, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, determined that certain diseases were primarily associated with the sleep states in animals. In their research, they emphasized that because so much in this area still remains unclear, animal models were very important for studies of sleep disorders. The physiology of sleep in animals is similar to that of humans. But why do we humans sleep? Researchers and scientists believe it helps us organize our memories of the day, that sleep acts as a kind of filing system for the brain. Without it, our thoughts become disorderly and confused, which leads to increased likelihood of accidents and a tendency to say and do bizarre things. Researchers also believe that sleep plays a key role in learning. We sleep so that the brain can integrate new knowledge and form new associations. Because of the similar sleeping pattern to that of humans, rats are often studied in order to increase our knowledge of human physiology. In one study, rats were kept awake for almost two weeks and their behavior was observed. Researchers found the sleep-deprived rats could hardly remember anything of what they had been taught that day. For example, one rat had been taught to recognize pictures of various Parisian landmarks in order to receive food. Pressing a button below a picture of the Louvre would result in food being released and so forth. However, when deprived of sleep, they would press buttons seemingly at random. In addition to rats, the fruit fly, a small insect that feeds and breeds on spoiled fruit, also has been used as a model organism and thousands of scientists around the world work on it. But why was the fruit fly chosen to be studied? It was for practical reasons. The most important one is that the relationship between fly and human genes is so close that the sequences of newly discovered human genes, including genes that show a susceptibility, can often be matched against their fly counterparts. This provides an indication of the function of the human gene and could help in the development of effective drugs to help people with sleeping disorders. Therefore, many scientists today choose to study the genetic structure of the fruit fly, which could make a particularly important contribution to the understanding of developmental processes in humans. In conclusion, sleep is a necessary part of life, not just for humans, 
but for the entire animal kingdom. Now I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.